The modern world is always rushing and rushing, but it knows not where it rushes to. Frenetic, grasping, but eternally insufficient. Consumption without ending. It is energy without purpose. No vision, no truth. Form without meaning. Power without grounding. Lost and drifting through time. How can we live in this madness? We are bound in many ways to the fate of our civilization, but free to bear witness to the changing of seasons, and free to understand the reasons why things fall apart. Modern man looks upon the sad landscape of his world where misery and suffering are steadily multiplying, life becoming synthetic, only fit for the artificial. The true vitality of man is sedated by a steady stream of distractions, a saline drip of sensory stimuli, and the limitations of time claim another victim for the piles. In this series, we will be taking a journey back in time so far back in time, in fact, that time somewhat loses its meaning. But such a journey is necessary if we wish to visit the world of tradition, a world that now exists only in the faintest of echoes, and only for those who listen closely enough to hear them. To make this journey, we will be relying on a special book, Revolt Against the Modern World, as our vehicle a book written by a man who wanted to lay down a testimony for those who are different, who are of a type that do not belong to this time. The man who wrote this book was the Baron Julius Evola, a man who has gifted the modern world with extensive philosophical writings on the world of tradition. Evola himself did not claim ownership over the ideas presented here. He saw himself as merely passing them on, keeping the torch lit until it could be handed off to the next generation. And now the torch lays at our feet, its flame barely flickering. Will we let what remains of this ancient, ever-burning light be snuffed out in the dirt? Or will we pick it up and rekindle its flame and proudly bear it forth? In order to be able to rekindle this flame, however, we must know what makes it burn and so we must commence our journey back into the world of tradition and learn the wisdom of our ancestors. We begin at the beginning, in the foreword of the book. In order to revolt against the modern world, we must first understand what is meant by the phrase, the modern world, and also what it means to revolt. When we think of the modern world, we think of the here and now, the most current, up-to-date version of our world. Anything in the past is outdated and no longer considered modern. This progressive thinking is part of our sickness. Evola says that anything in recorded history can be considered modern. He says that the first forces of modern decadence can already be seen occurring around 8,000 to 6,000 BC, followed by a second phase during the Roman Empire with the advent of Christianity, and the third phase, which was the twilight of the feudalism of the Middle Ages, which culminated in the Reformation, and this decisive point pushed us on a much more rapid downward trajectory, where we now find ourselves in the current phase of history. This phase roughly corresponds with the limits of recorded human history, and beyond this time, there exist only legends and myths. However, Evola points out that even this first phase did not simply concoct its decadence out of thin air, but notes that it was the inheritance of a previous age, which was known in the classical world as the Iron Age, or in Eastern cultures as the Dark Age. This of course raises the question, if everything that is historical is still considered modern from the point of view of tradition, 
then where do we find tradition? Evola says we must look beyond the modern world, and in order to do so, we must first have an understanding of time. He writes, In order to understand the spiritual background typical of every non-modern civilization, it is necessary to retain the idea that the opposition between historical times and prehistoric or mythological times is not the relative opposition proper to two homogeneous parts of the same time frame, but rather the qualitative and substantial oppositions between times or experiences of time that are not of the same kind. What Evola is saying here is that we cannot cling to the modern notion of time being linear, where prehistory came first, followed by modernity, existing one after the other in the same timeline. Instead, he is saying that these two things are such totally different experiences of time that they are not only not even comparable, but do not even exist within the same concept of time. To put this another way, if you were to step into the metaphysical world, what Plato would call the world of forms, this spiritual, ethereal realm where things exist as pure ideas and archetypes, then all events of human history would be potentially coexisting in a cyclical pattern that is not subject to the laws of physics in the material world. The reason linear time exists is because matter exists. Because of the way that space works, by separating matter into individual components, linear time necessarily becomes a factor. But in the metaphysical world, time doesn't exist that way. It doesn't need to, because it is not a material world. There is no matter. So it is possible there for events to coexist in a way where the past, present, and future are all one and the same. Imagine trying to explain time to an entity that has never experienced linear time and exists as an infinite being. How would you explain to them how something could exist and then not exist? How something could occur and then be over? Or how something could be created or destroyed? This theme has occasionally been explored in science fiction where aliens from other dimensions are sometimes depicted as not understanding linear time. But why is it relevant to understand this different concept of time in order to define the modern world? According to Evola, it is a key feature of modernity. Prehistoric peoples didn't experience linear time in the same way because they were much more connected to the metaphysical, which is on a different dimensional plane than our physical one. Thus, when trying to understand the prehistoric world in which we will be looking for tradition, we will come up against large gaps in our understanding if we look at it through the lens of linear time. For example, creation myths might have some truth to them, but trying to interpret them literally in a linear time frame will make them seem implausible. However, those events likely occurred before linear time was a factor. This concept is alien to modern man because he is too far removed from the experience of regular and close contact with the metaphysical. This disconnect from the metaphysical world is a big part of the reason for our modern sickness. The modern person looks at history and believes he is an evolved form on the fast track to progress. He thinks that because his manipulation of matter is improving, through the use of his rational and technological abilities, that he is reaching a crescendo. However, what is his aim? Presently, there is a push towards better and better artificial intelligence and robots. What greater declaration of the fallen state of man could there be than that he believes with euphoric certainty that his greatest achievement will be to create a synthetic replica of himself that has no soul as the final and complete ending of the human experiment. How much more removed from nature and spirituality can you be when the culmination of your profane science is to create a materialistic intelligent life form devoid of any divine spark? 
When we think about the world of tradition, we need to think of it as a platonic form. The real world is the metaphysical world. This world is a mere reflection of that real world. We often think of our material world as the real one, and the metaphysical is something imaginary, ghost-like, or even fake. But in actuality, it's the other way around. And this will be critical for understanding why it is so hard to find genuine tradition throughout the ages, because when these platonic forms, these archetypes, enter into being in the material world and must then be governed by the laws of matter, it distorts the reflection. And these laws include time, which is perhaps the biggest factor in why these reflections are less than perfect. If you were a primordial or prehistoric man, time would be less of a factor because of your ability to access and connect with the metaphysical, and we can see remnants of this today in those advanced ascetics who are able to enter into deep meditation. They may feel during that time that they have left their body and traveled for days or lived a thousand lifetimes, only to return and find that mere hours have passed. A good example to illustrate this point can be found in Lord of the Rings. In Lord of the Rings, recall how Gandalf was lost to the Balrog, or so we thought. Gandalf the Grey tumbled down into the abyss battling this ancient demon, and Frodo and the rest of the Fellowship thought that was it for poor Gandalf. But he returns as Gandalf the White not too long after. Recall what he says about his battle with the Balrog. He says he battled the demon for many ages. How is this possible for Gandalf to have battled for what must have been thousands of years, only to return to Middle-earth a short time later? The answer is that Gandalf was able to enter the metaphysical world and do battle there, where linear time and the limitations of matter do not apply. Other examples from the Lord of the Rings would include how Frodo would enter into a ghostly realm whenever he put the ring on, or the scene where Aragorn must recruit the ghost army. The standard laws of time and space did not apply in those realms. So for a traditional man, if he wanted to be constantly in communion with God, this is how he would do it. And because he would be entering into different spiritual dimensions, the laws that govern this plane would not apply, and thus, he would experience time totally differently because he is not spending all his time in the linear temporal realm. We can see a remnant of this in the languages of primitive people, in which they may have many unusual grammatical tenses for indicating time, or no tenses at all. Time is essentially just an illusion that we are subject to, that we have agreed to participate in during our time in the material world. We are governed by it because we cannot apprehend a different state of being. This leads us then to what it means to revolt against the modern world now that we have some understanding of what the modern world actually is. Evola makes only a brief but clear mention in the foreword of what the path of revolt entails, setting the tone for what will be laid out in the rest of the book. What he tells us is this, what is really needed is not to toss back and forth in a bed of agony, but to awaken and get up. What does he mean by this? He says that reacting and protesting are not sufficient. We need instead actions, not reactions. Actions which originate from the inner dimension and testify to the possession of a foundation, a principle, or a center. In order to revolt, one must spiritually awaken and orient towards these inner principles. We shouldn't try to pick up faded transmission signals from the past in order to mimic them. Instead, we need to recreate the original event. We need modern ascetics and spiritual guides, and in absence of them, we need to become sages unto ourselves as we seek divinity. Evola criticizes modern politics as being reactionary, and because it is reactionary, there is always a tactical lag. You cannot defend tradition in this way. Tradition must be embraced and cultivated internally. 
The modern world is filled with people who have too much free time on their hands, which they use unwisely. They believe they are fighting the slide into decadence by arguing their political talking points or by being outraged when what they ought to be doing is reading, meditating, and making an art of living in a positive, constructive, and wholesome way. Be in the world, but not of the world. In closing out the foreword, Evola speaks about his methodology. He writes, In the course of this book, I will refer to various Eastern and Western traditions, choosing those that exemplify through a clearer and more complete expression the same spiritual principle or phenomenon. The method that I use has as little in common with the eclecticism or comparative methodology of modern scholars as the method of parallaxes, which is used to determine the exact position of a star by reference to how it appears from various places. Also, this method has as little in common with eclecticism, to borrow an image of Gwinnons, as the multilingual person's choice of the language that offers the best expression to a given thought. Thus, what I call the traditional method is usually characterized by a double principle, ontologically and objectively by the principle of correspondence, which ensures essential and functional correlation between analogous elements, presenting them as simple homologous forms of the appearance of central and unitary meaning, and epistemologically and subjectively by the generalized use of the principle of induction, which is here understood as a discursive approximation of a spiritual intuition, in which what is realized is the integration and the unification of the diverse elements encountered in the same one meaning and the same one principle. It is important to understand what he means by this. He is saying that he will be drawing from both Eastern and Western traditions, not to appear well-read and worldly, or to impress anyone with his wide knowledge, but to find the best examples of a concept possible. He is looking for the best vantage point from which to view tradition, and if there is no good Western example, then he will look to Eastern examples, and he posits that they are integrated into one meaning. His traditional method is one that is not necessarily rationally based, but more ephemeral and abstract. However, he will aim to show a correspondence between both the objective and metaphysical nature of existence, and likewise will aim to show a correspondence between what is subjective and the philosophical limits of human knowledge. Rather than relying on the deductive reasoning that is favored in the modern world, he will make a generalized use of inductive reasoning with the goal of trying to integrate and unify many diverse elements that all share the same core principles and meaning. Evola divides this book up into two parts. The first part is called The World of Tradition, and will illustrate the main principles that the life of traditional man would manifest, and the second part is called Genesis and Face of the Modern World, which will discuss the processes that have led to the development of the modern world and lay out a metaphysical view of history. Evola states that he will be offering guiding principles and laying out only the essential elements as basically a kind of roadmap for those who are capable of an awakening to point them in the direction they need to go. It is this roadmap that we will be relying on in order to rediscover the world of tradition. Along the way, we will collect more and more kindling for the torch that has been left to us to carry in the hopes that it will burn brightly once more. Spoils of light all turned into infinity Give me sight and a sense of my destiny Connect me to the transcendent mystery Show me fire that shines for it.